From our 22 News Broadcast Center, this is 22 News in Focus. Good Sunday afternoon. Welcome to 22 News in Focus. I'm Ashley Afonso. Just two weeks from now, hundreds will be at the Mass Mutual Center in Springfield to raise money for a good cause. The Caritas Gala on Saturday, April 21st will benefit Mercy Behavioral Health Care and the Mercy Emergency Department's Opioid Community Outreach for Education, Intervention, and Treatment. Joining me today to discuss the event and the cause it will benefit is Mark Fulco, President of Mercy Medical Center, Anthony Galuni, Hamden District Attorney, and Paul Mantinoni, Honorary Chair of the Gala and Vice Chair of the Board of Trustees for Mercy Medical Center. So let's start by talking about the event. How did you guys come up with this event to benefit this cause? So the, uh, the idea for the event uh, came from really a team of people that were interested in raising money for um, a, a, a very important issue in our community, and that is uh, opioid addiction. And we've got some excellent services in opioid addiction, but the interest was in raising additional funds uh, to, uh, to help us further the services that we provide and to add some new services. So how did you come up with this particular a gala, a night of fun? So uh, we know people like to have a good time and come together and celebrate, and we, we combine uh, some celebration with some fundraising. And in, in addition to just r uh, raising some funds for uh, this important initiative, we also honor uh, an individual or, or several individuals who have made an impact on the particular condition that we're uh, raising funds for. And this year, we're proud to honor uh, Governor Charlie Baker, uh, who obviously has done a lot of work um, in furthering uh, the uh, prevention and treatment of uh, opioid and addiction, uh, opioid addiction, and uh, Dan Keenan, uh, who is our Vice President of Adv Advocacy for Trinity Health New England, and he has also um, really helped reduce the stigma of uh, opioid addiction and addiction in general in our region. Okay, so who can attend this event? Everybody. We want everybody to attend this event, Ashley. Um, so uh, the, our, our, our tickets are on sale. The event is uh, April 21st at the Mass Mutual uh, Center. And uh, yeah, the, we, we want everybody to attend and support uh, Mercy Hospital's cause in, in fighting this uh, addiction, yeah. So this is the second year of the event, correct? Yep. All right, so tell us a little bit about last year. Last year was fantastic. We had, uh, a, a, my best friend John Schoberg was the honorary chair, so. We're doing all we can to beat him uh, this year, <laughs> but uh, it, was, it was just a wonderful kickoff uh, to an event. It was very well attended. Uh, a lot of money was raised, um, uh, you know, to, to, to kick off the fight. And uh, it is, as the, the district attorney and Mark can tell you, the, the fight is still there. Um, and so after speaking with Mark, and Mark uh, suggested that maybe we, we, we do it again and follow up with another one on, on addiction services. And uh, that's how we chose to do it again this year. We're gonna hit it harder than ever. Okay, and the theme this year, reach out. Tell me about that. How did you guys come up with that? And what exactly does that mean? Well, so, it's Motown. Yeah, it's, it's <laughs> Motown. Um, it's, it's ironic because uh, I just returned, uh, grateful to return uh, back to Springfield to serve uh, the uh, community after spending two years in Detroit. And Detroit is the home of Motown and the Motown sound. So this year we thought it would be really fun to have a Motown theme uh, for several reasons. Um, the, uh, the new um, president and CEO of Trinity Health in New England uh, hails from Detroit, from Motown. Uh, I spent two years there and uh, who doesn't like Motown music? Uh, it's so much fun. You can't stop dancing, and we want people to enjoy the evening. It's going to be a great night for a great cause, and we want to have some fun and, and celebrate the great things that uh, we have the privilege of doing for our community. Okay, so last year you guys raised a substantial amount of money. How did that benefit the program? The, the proceeds that were raised from the gala uh, went directly to um, a program that we have in the emergency room to help with opioid treatment outreach and education to help reduce uh, the impact of opioid addiction in our community with the intention of reducing uh, the number of individuals who end up addicted to opioids and um, uh, to avoid the deaths that occur from uh, opioid um, use and abuse. Is there anything in particular this year's funds will go to? Uh, it's going to go to the same uh, program as it did last year. Um, that's right. Um, okay, let's talk about the opioid crisis now in Western Mass. We are still facing a crisis. How bad is it in our area? 
It's still a very serious problem, and I think it's fairly characterized as a crisis. Uh, I will say through the efforts of, of um, the, the folks here uh, at Mercy and Trinity Health regionally, as well as people in, in the private and, and nonprofit and public sectors have made some progress uh, in the last year or two, I think, um, starting to combat the issue of addiction, the issue of opiate, opiate use, and the th amount of fatal overdoses. So there's some progress being made, but we're certainly still in the midst of it. There's certainly still uh, really thousands of people in this Commonwealth, in this region alone, that need our help with their addiction and with what they're struggling with. Uh, and from a law enforcement perspective, we still have a lot of work to do. And that's the approach my office has taken, really working uh, to help people struggling with addiction, but drawing that line and enforcing the law on those who are profiting from addiction and using the criminal justice system uh, to work on that supply side of illicit opiates and making sure that we can take as many of those off the streets uh, while we're helping those, again, who, who need our help and deserve our help because they're struggling with what we now know is this awful disease of addiction. So when you see private organizations having events like this to help fight the opioid crisis and people who are going through this, how much does that help your office? Uh, I think it helps the cause, and it certainly helps the, the, the role that my office is playing. You know, we are working in really in all facets. We have numerous partnerships with, with Mercy here in Springfield and Trinity Health regionally uh, on the issue of addiction and many other things. So the more sort of uh, hands we have helping to work on this crisis in particular, I think the better off we're going to be. I was at the Caritas Gala last year, and it was a terrific time, and it was a very kind of spirited event. I think there was a lot of hopefulness there, especially um, you know, looking at the example that Sister Caritas has set for us. And I think this year promises to be the same. We're acknowledging the seriousness of this problem, obviously, but we're there to celebrate it. We're there to support the cause. We're there to bring acknowledgment. And this year with Dan Keenan and Governor Charlie Baker, uh, honoring them for their, their progress and their work is just, I think, a terrific event, a terrific cause. And how important is the community recognition of this whole crisis? It's hugely important, and I, and I think if I can speak for, for Mark and Paul, uh, to some extent that's probably why Governor Baker is being acknowledged, because when he came into office in 2015, he and his administration, along with Lieutenant Governor Polito, really worked on a campaign, as we did here locally, to educate people about what this addiction is, what is going on. Remember, when I came into office at the same time in early 2015, it was the advent of the issue, at least in the public's consciousness. And it was like, what's happening here? And I got that question, well, why is this happening? What are we doing? And Governor Baker in particular, with the Stop the Stigma campaign, really worked to educate people, remove that stigma so people who are suffering from addiction could come out from the shadow, so to speak, and get the services that they so desperately need. So um, it's important to bring awareness, it's important to educate, and it's important to bring those people who can help us, who can support uh, Mercy and Trinity Health through the Caritas Gala, and it's important to educate the public on what we're doing and how everybody can work together to solve this problem. How did you choose your honorees this year? It was very easy to choose mm -hmm. the honorees, and it was unanimous. Uh, so um, the district attorney mentioned the great work of Governor Baker. So last year, in 2017, there were about 1,500 deaths from opioid overdose in the state of Massachusetts. That's down by 8%. So there's hundreds of lives that have been saved as a result of the courageous work that uh, Governor Baker has spearheaded. So for us, again, that was a no-brainer. Uh, Dan Keenan has worked um, tirelessly in this community uh, to raise awareness of opioid addiction. And for us, uh, when you think about the 100 plus, 130 approximate deaths uh, that we have each year from uh, opioid overdose, uh, in this community. Dan has mobilized uh, the legislators, the governor, uh, to help us in this community to address that problem. And we have seen tremendous impact uh, on, on the lives of people. So saving lives in our community was, uh, was why we decided to honor Dan. And in your facilities, when you hear from people uh, that are there, do you hear that this is one of the biggest problems facing our community? It, it really is. It's, it is uh, of crisis proportion. Uh, it's pervasive, and it's not just in our community, uh, but it's in every community around the country. And if you think about the deaths that we had uh, in our community, there were about 40 deaths last year in Springfield uh, from uh, opioid overdose. Um, but there were also 15 deaths in Westfield from opioid overdose. 
Um, and that eclipses the number of deaths in Holyoke, which is about 10. So it's in every community. It's in every socioeconomic and demographic sector of our community. Um, it's um, regardless of, of age, sex, which is interesting. When we think about these types of uh, problems, we think that you know drug use and overdose is just limited uh, to, to youth and, and younger folks, but we're actually seeing an increase in the number of older adults, um, geriatric patients, that are addicted to opioids because of the pervasive prescription of opioids in, in the medical community. Okay. The opioid epidemic has hit our local area, as you just heard, and when we return, we'll talk about Mercy Medical Center's work to fight the crisis. You're watching 22 News in Focus. Welcome back to 22 News in Focus. Today we're talking about a local program put together by Mercy Medical Center to help fight the opioid epidemic. So let's talk about some of the programs you guys have at your facilities that are helping treat this crisis. So we have a, a variety of services at the Mercy Medical Center, including the services obviously that we offer through our emergency department. But our Providence Behavioral Health Hospital has both inpatient and outpatient services that really specialize in addiction treatment uh, and prevention. Um, but on the um, uh, treatment side, we have uh, uh, some specialized inpatient units, uh, including our detoxification unit, and a relatively new unit called clinical stabilization. And it's a, a program for patients that have gone through, typically gone through a detoxification program, but not quite ready to return to the community. So uh, they have a, a stay in the clinical stabilization service to get ready uh, to integrate back into the community. What are the ages you're serving? You mentioned that a little bit earlier, but. On our uh, detox programs, it's typically adults uh, 18 and older, um, but we also are, are seeing younger patients that are treated in some of our other services. But on the detox and clinical stabilization service, it is uh, adults that we treat, and uh, rage, ages range from 18 to, to 60, 65 years old. Um, it does skew um, to the sort of the, the middle range of, of 18 to 40, um, uh, typically but we're treating patients across the age uh, spectrum. I'm sure it depends on the patient, but how long is the average stay? It really, it does depend on the patient. The detoxification stays uh, can be longer. The clinical stabilization stays um, are typically five to seven days. Okay, and how costly is it to run programs like this? Um, it's, it's, it is expensive, but the return on investment uh, for the community uh, is incredible. For every dollar that we spend, on um, addiction uh, treatment and, and prevention. We save about $12 in uh, the costs of, of crime and other health services that would have to be expended if our services uh, were not in place. And in addition to our inpatient services, we also have extensive outpatient services and we actually um, administer about 1,000 doses of methadone a day. So that's 1,000 individuals uh, across the age spectrum uh, across, again, the socio-demographic spectrum that um, would have an insatiable appetite for opioids within 24 to 48 hours if they weren't receiving that outpatient treatment through one of our programs. So, Paul, how are you getting the information out there that this is really an area of our community that needs funds? Well, me and our, my co-chair, uh, Dr. Hamdani from, uh, from Mercy, uh, you know, we're tasked with going out to the community, get, going to the corporate members uh, of our community and, and individuals for, you know, sponsorships and, and getting involved uh, financially uh, to help us with the cause. And, you know, one of the, one of the benefits of, of being vice chair of Mercy Hospital is uh, Mercy, Mercy sells itself. Everybody knows that we're a faith-based hospital and how important that is, particularly in the area of addiction services where, quite frankly, when when, when people who, who, who have addiction uh, and, and are, are, are in a place that's so dark they can, they can hardly see the light, they, they turn to faith. And it's, it's a very important place for us to be. And in that aspect, it, it, it sells itself. Um, we'd always like to do better. There's, you know, there's certainly an infinite amount of funds we can use toward this. But we're, th this is a very strong gala. We're really proud of what we've done so far, and there's a couple weeks to go. From people who have gone through programs with your facilities, what have been some of the reactions? We just celebrated the one year anniversary of the clinical stabilization service and I had the privilege of attending uh, the celebration where patients who 
uh, had been discharged from the program returned. And I remember clearly seeing uh, two gentlemen who, uh, who came uh, to the celebration and they look great. Uh, clearly they've gotten their lives back and they were uh, well dressed. Um, they had uh, talked about the, the jobs that they had gotten since uh, leaving our program. So they're back being uh, productive members of our community and so grateful. One of them um, went to one of the Sisters of Providence who was uh, in attendance at the celebration and hugged and kissed her and thanked her uh, for, um, for the service that we provide because uh, we helped him get his life back. Let's talk about prevention. How important is that and how much work takes goes into educating people about this crisis? Uh, I think it's foundational to, to uh, ultimately succeeding in this fight and, and making this really a problem of the past. I mean, addiction is always going to exist. It always really has in some form or another. Uh, but we think that prevention and education, especially with young people, is so critically important to sensitize them, to make them aware of the threats and the risks that are out there. And my office has done a great deal of that in the last three years. And particularly, we try to talk about how it starts, right? What is the genesis of an addiction? And we talk about how it can start with lawful prescriptions that come from a doctor or a dentist and how that uh, you know, can be mismanaged and can result in a problem that leads to addiction. Of course, we also talk about how it starts recreationally with young people at parties and so forth and how they can start with one thing and it leads to a, a very dire path for these young people. So what we've done through our community outreach program and education is really go out to, to high schools and even younger kids to talk about this. And you know we've really uh, made contact with thousands and thousands of young people across this county with that very message to say, hey, this is how it can start. Uh, very often we bring in people who are dealing with addiction, who are in recovery, to talk about their very personal stories. Um, and we have a video that we produce that's 27 minutes long that presents these various stories and is ultimately a story of, of hope. It really shows that recovery is possible. Uh, Dr. Roos from Mercy Medical Center is, is featured in that video talking about some of the clinical aspects, but also you know, how, how people can overcome addiction and that services are out there. So again, it's critically important to educate and prevent as much as we can because as, Dr., as Mr. Fulco has talked about, um, once addiction takes hold, it's very difficult. It's very labor intensive. It's very cost intensive. Uh, to bring somebody into recovery, it's certainly worth it, I think, in, in our opinions here. Uh, but if we can prevent that first, that's, that's really the, the magic. That's really what we're shooting for. Going back 20 years, it was trying to prevent kids from smoking and drinking. But are kids aware now of the fact that this is a crisis in our area? I think so. I, th I, think, we've, I think we've really successfully penetrated that population. Uh, with this message of prevention, I think you know, just three years ago, when you look back, as we talked about relative to Governor Baker and removing the stigma from addiction, uh, it, we started at zero almost, you know, and I think in, in a period of time, and certainly not just my office, but those in the nonprofit, and private, and government sectors have really worked hard to get this message out. Uh, and, and news media has done a good job talking about this crisis. So I think uh, most young people understand the risks. They understand that this is a disease, and it can really mushroom out of one's control very easily and very quickly. So I think we're, we're doing that work now, especially with young people, that is going to reap rewards down the road. You know, when they come to that crossroads, when they come to that opportunity, whether it's illicit drugs in a recreational situation or it's uh, a situation where they're prescribed, you know, drugs or opiates for a sports injury or a dental procedure, that understanding is there. So I think that, again, is going to reap rewards down the road. Okay. At Mercy, you guys are obviously focusing on treatment, but how do you educate people uh, when they come in for different doctor's appointments about this crisis and how to prevent it there? So one of, uh, one of the initiatives that has started in the medical community is recognition that we do have a problem. And uh, it, it started with um, recognition by the, the physicians and, and other prescribers uh, in our community. But, you know, correct, proper, and safe prescribing uh, is something that um, our, our clinicians have, have um, uh, really um, identified as a start, the first start. Um, we also educate patients about how they should properly take and store their medications. Um, on the Mercy campus, we have an uh, outpatient pharmacy, and one of the things we do is, is counsel the patients about how they should take their medications and how they should store their medications, because as the district attorney said, quite often this starts with, uh, an opioid addiction will start with a legal prescription. Uh, it could also um, begin with uh, a, a, a family member 
um, taking somebody else's medication, and then they get addicted to uh, to the drug. So the safe storage, the safe utilization and storage of the prescriptions is really the first start. But we also have educational programs. We collaborate um, with other providers uh, in delivering, and certainly through our emergency department, we identify it's. We see a lot of patients that aren't necessarily in an overdose situation. We do treat over 100 overdoses a year in our emergency department, but there are thousands of patients that present to the emergency room with other conditions, sometimes with drug-seeking behavior, and we identify those patients and we educate them and try to get them into, uh, into programs so that we can, we can prevent uh, a further spiraling of their condition. Okay. When we come back, we'll talk about some of the current addiction services that are offered at Mercy Medical Center. Stay with us. You're watching 22 News in Focus. You're watching 22 News in Focus. Today, we're talking about the Caritas Gala being held Saturday, April 21st to raise money for Mercy Behavioral Health Care's Opioid Epidemic Treatment Program. That program is a huge effort to help fight the opioid crisis here in Western Massachusetts. So let's talk about the need for beds. This is something we constantly hear. The governor's made an effort about that. Let's talk about your need at Mercy. So uh, the Commonwealth has, has worked very closely with us to help expand the services that we're able to provide in this community. Uh, in fact, the, the clinical stabilization service that we uh, spoke about earlier um, has increased the number of beds uh, in the Providence Behavioral Health Hospital for addiction services by 27. So that's a dramatic increase. We're able to service hundreds of individuals each year that we couldn't service in the past. Um, Overall, with the uh, assistance of the Commonwealth, we have been able to expand our addiction uh, services in the, in the treatment area by over 33%. If there was no cost to add beds, how many beds would you say you could add immediately? Um, hundreds, unfortunately. Uh, so it is very expensive. Uh, the cost to treat a addicted patient on an outpatient basis is about $8,000 a year. So we're uh, it's costing us about $12 million, uh, just to provide some of those services. That's not inpatient. That's solely the, uh, the outpatient services. And with many of these services, we don't necessarily get reimbursed our entire cost. So it is expensive, and we're hoping to close the gap in um, what it costs, between what it costs us to deliver the services and what we get paid uh, with uh, fundraisers like the Caritas Gala. So that brings me to my next question. How much does a gala like this help close the gap for oh, that. I mean, we're, are, we have uh, ambitious goals this year, Ashley. Um, uh, we, we, we will definitely surpass last year. I think we, we already know that we're at, we're at that point. But we'll, we'll, we hope to raise uh, over $500,000 uh, that evening. So we're, we're, we're pretty excited about it. Just to help people understand, $500,000, what are you able to do? So that will go to some of the uh, programs and services that are not reimbursed, the things that we want to do. For example, we've started some innovative programs in the emergency department uh, where we're starting intervention early. So we're identifying patients uh, that have an addiction and we're starting to uh, introduce care right in the emergency room or when a patient gets admitted uh, to Mercy Medical Center uh, for a medical condition that they also have an addiction. Um, and so Dr. Rob Roos, uh, who's our Vice President of uh, Behavioral Health and is an addiction specialist, uh, he has some very innovative ideas about how we can begin treatment earlier. And he started to implement some of those, and uh, some of those programs were not necessarily um, reimbursed for. So these dollars will help us uh, with the intervention and treatment earlier uh, for patients and helping to break the cycle of addiction. Okay, you hear firsthand in the community the need for beds. When you hear from people the, pro the pro process of going through and getting a bed, what is that like for somebody who's suffering from addiction? Yeah, uh, anecdotally, I, th I think it's challenging for, for people. There's no doubt about that. And as Mark said, you know, there's, there's really almost an infinite need at this point. Uh, but I think we, you know, the, the solutions or the resources are catching up to the problem. You hear the, the increase at Mercy, which is quite substantial and you're seeing similar increases in other facilities, other providers with which we work in the nonprofit sector are, are doing their best to provide those services and not turn people away. We know that addiction is, is a long-term problem and has to be acutely solved in really phases that go on from six months 
to 12 months and then the services have to continue in some regard. So the resource is there for people to get first into that detoxification stage and then on into recovery is, is obviously critically important. But um, with efforts like the Caritas Gala and what Mercy and Trinity Health are doing and, and other institutions is, is important. And again, I think we're making progress towards uh, satisfying the need and getting this uh, out of a crisis phase. At any given time, are your beds full? Absolutely. Um, they're often full, uh, which is one of the challenges uh, for treatment in, in our community. But it, uh, again, with the expansion, we're able to treat you know 27 additional individuals every day. And um, with an average you know stay of, of a week or so, uh, that's 100 more individuals or so that, uh, that we can treat every month. Okay, we've mentioned how this is a crisis and it has affected so many people in our community, but there are also a lot of people who are not aware of how serious this is. What would you say to those people um, about why funds are needed? Um, we need the help uh, to help those who are really in need. Uh, this is a, a condition that um, has only recently, the stigma has been unraveled. Um, this reaches every, every family. If you haven't been touched by addiction, in your family, you're lucky. Uh, it's, a, it's a personal thing for me. Uh, my family has been touched um, by this disease, and um, it's, it's so important to have services that are available because um, if, if your family has not been touched uh, by this disease yet, um, it's likely that you will be touched at some point. And then will, where will you turn uh, for help with uh, an increasing number of people who do have this condition? and a lack of resources and, and facilities to, to treat those folks. Um, it's really important that uh, we get support from the community so that we can close that gap and give access to everybody who is facing an addiction condition. Okay, you mentioned the stigma. How do we fight this stigma? Well, uh, I, I think in the last few years, we mentioned Governor Baker's efforts, which was a statewide effort. Uh, it was a hashtag stop the stigma, and there were billboards and commercials and so forth around that. Um, you know, what we've tried to do is something similar where we're, we're talking about this, you know, we're starting a conversation uh, and not people who are, you know, touched by this condition or who are suffering from it themselves, but with, with people in, in really a preventative educational posture. You know, we've gone around to a lot of high schools and conducted uh, seminars of sorts or conferences at night and invited, uh, you know, the, the, the student body population, but also parents of the student body population to talk about you know this issue and how it can touch all, all kinds of people and what mark said you know i wholeheartedly agree with this touches all kinds of people you know what we know is it's a disease and it's not a moral failing uh it's not a, just a series of bad decisions or mistakes you know there there is an, a medical issue here it's a disease unlike many other diseases and it deserves to be treated that way. So that conversation is really important for people to understand, and I think we've made some headway in that regard. Hundreds of people in one room on one night to raise money for this cause seems like an also a great way to stop the stigma. What kind of discussions are happening that night? Well, we'll have uh, you know we'll have uh, speakers you know come up. The governor will say a few words. Uh, Mark will say a few words. And uh, the Dr. Roos will probably be on hand to say a few words. So the message will get out, uh, you know, with respect to the event, similar to our discussion uh, that we're having here today. So, and then the, uh, and then uh, although it's a very serious, very serious matter, uh, Ashley, then we're going to turn to an evening of fun because it, we, it, there's a light side in the sense that let, let, let's celebrate us being together as well and celebrate the cause and celebrate uh, the funds that were raised uh, to help us go forward. But if I may, ask, I just want to say on behalf of Mercy Hospital, we have a real partner here with the district attorney. And uh, we're really proud of him. And he's, he's a real partner in the battle. And I think we can say that on behalf of the medical community in the greater Springfield area. But speaking selfishly, he's someone special. And we're honored to have him. And he's really helping us in the fight. Thank you. All right. I would echo that. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> All right. When we return, we'll talk about the stigma a little bit more surrounding opioid addiction and how that can hinder treatment. You're watching 22 News in Focus.
Welcome back to 22 News in Focus. Today we're talking about the opioid epidemic in western Massachusetts and the effort to fight it. Part of that fight is getting rid of the stigma, something we were just talking about. Let's continue that discussion. How much more difficult does it make getting someone treatment when they believe the whole stigma is there and they don't want other people maybe to know about this? So I think in the past it's it's been a blaming of the individual who has the addiction, that they're, they have some type of weakness or they brought this upon themselves or they, they did it to themselves. And uh, as, as medical research has proven, it, it's not that. This is a, a medical condition. It is a disease. And so, so breaking that barrier uh, has been critical uh, to identifying that we have a problem here. Also breaking some of the stigma around the use and abuse of prescription medications. And even Governor Baker, when he spoke in Springfield at a chamber event two years ago, uh, he talked about how his own son had been prescribed uh, hundreds of opioid pills uh, after breaking his arm. And so we're, you know, we're changing the thinking about that's not probably the best thing to do with a 20-something year old. Uh, and the possibility of that individual um, getting addicted as a result of that, again, through no fault of their own, being medically prescribed uh, the medication. In fact, we get, um, we get uh, scored in our hospital as to how well we manage pain. And so for our society, uh, those types of things have, I think, contributed uh, to, uh, um, to the prevalence of uh, opioid addiction in, in our community. Okay, so someone may recognize that they have an addiction, but maybe their family doesn't understand it. How do you get other people to understand that this is a disease? Well, I think through the services that the, the person dealing with the addiction will get, uh, it becomes readily apparent. And as Mark said, I mean, medical evidence is very clear, research is very clear. Uh, there's, a, there's a predisposition that exists in some people that can often lead to addiction where it wouldn't with other people. And, and that's what we're talking about uh, in being involved in your prescribing. You know, if you're a patient and you're dealing with a prescriber, be participatory in that in that prescription process where you know I don't think I need that much or I have a high pain tolerance I might not need that many pills or I might not need an opiate at all um, but to your to your question Ashley um, you know it's 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 really just continuing to spread that message so everybody understands this and I think you know going back to something you said earlier in the discussion here you know it was cigarette smoking 20 years ago and other issues that we've kind of surmounted over the course of, uh, of time, you know, this is educating the public so everybody understands, uh, you know, what the issues are and, and what the particulars are. And this being a crisis, you know, it's starting to circulate where I think, you know, everybody understands the dangers of it and what's important about that and what's positive about that is that people are going to be more aware and, and in a more of a preventative posture for themselves, for their children and people around them. So uh, the more we can get this message out there, things like the Caritas Gala, the work that the governor and lieutenant governor have done, the work that you know my office is trying to do is spreading that message to prevent people from getting into situations where addiction can spawn and uh, making sure people understand what the nature of this disease is. Okay, let's talk about where to start when someone needs to get treatment. They come to your facility. How, what does that process look like? I would say it even starts before then. Uh, district attorney talked about the interaction with your uh, physician, with your provider, um, and being participatory in that. That is a, a, a great suggestion. Um, but if you do have a problem or a family member has a problem, you have to, you have to reach out. Uh, you have to not be embarrassed to say something, to reach out to someone, and hopefully that's a medical professional. So I think it starts with uh, your primary care physician and talking with your primary care physician openly and honestly. Um, about the condition. Um, if uh, you, a family member, doesn't have um, a primary care physician, then reaching out to some other source. Certainly, Mercy Medical Center, Providence Behavioral Health Hospital are available uh, at any time that anybody needs help. Um, our contact information can be found on our website at mercycares.com. We're there to help. But my recommendation would be to start with the primary care physician who's in the best position to really assess the situation and to channel the individual, to refer the individual to the best appropriate care in a timely way. Okay, so if someone goes through the program successfully, what services are now needed after that to keep them in, from going back? So like we've understood with other addictions, it really is a, a, a lifelong thing. And so ongoing treatment, there, and there are several ongoing treatments that are available. There's uh, cognitive therapy, which is discussion therapy that often happens in groups. We run groups at Providence Behavioral Ho 
health hospital. Um, and they're very successful in um, getting people to, to network with other individuals who uh, share that addiction uh, disorder and getting support from professionals so that they can continue their really lifelong uh, fight uh, against addiction. Okay, let's focus on some positives now. Do you see an end to this fight in sight? Well, candidly, an end is, is probably hard to, to sort of, um, you know, speculate about. An, an end to addiction, I, I think, is, is not something that we're ready to talk about, at least at this juncture. Um, I, but I think we are at maybe the early stages of improvement. I think we're coming out of the, the real brunt of the crisis, I hope and I think. And we look at some current overdose figures that come through my office, and we're, we're seeing some, some ebbs. And that's very important, and that's hopeful for us. So I think with the work that we're doing, I think across all sectors, all working in the same direction, uh, we are seeing improvements in some very important areas. And I think in the years to come, we're going to see that really accelerate. And I, and I, and I think, and I certainly hope and pray, uh, that in four, six, eight years, this is going to be a substantially less significant issue and no longer a crisis. Have you heard from people in the community that have gone through programs like the ones that Mercy mm -hmm. offers about how this has changed their lives and had a big impact on them? Uh, all the time, frequently. You know, I spend a lot of time uh, outside of the office in, in, in groups. Uh, we have a Hampton County Addiction Task Force uh, that brings together a lot of the people in, in those communities, addiction and recovery communities. And I hear the stories of success and hopefulness and wellness all the time. And programs like what Mercy provides and what Paul and Mark are at the at the tip of the spear providing are so, so important. It literally saves lives. It literally changes lives. And uh, there are hundreds and thousands of people out there who have gone through Mercy's programs and other uh, providers who have surmounted this issue of addiction. You know, it's a, recovery is a lifelong issue. There's no question about that. Uh, but, you know, getting into recovery and living a well and healthy and productive life is possible for people in the throes of addiction right now. And that's, I think, the message we're trying to spread with the Caritas Gala and with, with our time here, that you know we can do some good work, we can change lives. And once you're in the throes of addiction, there is light at the end of the tunnel. And uh, through what Mercy does, um, that's, that's, that's an access point, no question. Tell us about some of the success your programs have had. Um, we have, uh, I want to share one, one story. We, um, we heard about recently. Uh, it was a, a patient who uh, told her her own story about um, being pregnant and being addicted. And the story she shared was that she got into um, a methadone program at uh, Providence Behavioral Health Hospital. And uh, she was able to um, uh, curb her appetite uh, for opiates to the point where uh, she was able to have, uh, to give birth to a, a healthy baby. Uh, she's now fully in recovery. The baby is healthy. She's healthy. Uh, she's productive, and she has a full-time job. And so we've helped her um, get her life back and to uh, give life to 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 another human uh, who is now living a healthy life. And I think that's the ultimate success story. On a personal level, how does that feel? You said you were personally yeah. touched in yeah. a way by this crisis. Yeah. How does it feel to see success stories like it, that? It, it's, it's wonderful. That's why we do what we do every day. We're called to be a transforming and healing presence uh, in our community. Um, and um, that's why we come to work every day, to have that kind of impact on lives. And it's not every day that we can, we can save a life uh, and help somebody to recovery. Um, but we are succeeding the reduction in the number of, of deaths alone um, is just tremendous impact on what is a, a community crisis. All right, when we return, we're talking all about the gala and how you can get involved in this fight. You're watching 22 News in Focus. Watching 22 News in Focus. Today we've been talking about the Caritas Gala on April 21st that will benefit Mercy Behavioral Health Care's opioid epidemic treatment program. So if someone wants to get involved and attend, how can they get tickets? Well, contact, uh, I think you contact Mercy Hospital. I think everybody in Western Mass got an invitation, I hope, mm -hmm. if we did our jobs uh, correctly. But uh, at this stage, I would call the Fund Development Office of Mercy Hospital if somebody hasn't gotten. Uh, an invitation and we'll, we'll, we'll shoot one out by email or other, I, otherwise right away. Um, but uh, it'll, it'll be a really exciting evening of, I think Mark's selling a lot of tickets 
just so people could see how bad I dance, <laughs> and I, I think that's probably half 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 of the attendees. But um, we have a silent auction with great great auction items. We're having a live auction as well, and what we have, Ashley, that's pretty rare. I think most of the people in the room, including me, haven't seen one before. We have a NFL football opus book, weighs about 80 pounds, mm. and it's a chronology of the history of uh, Super Bowls, and. Um, we have a sheet signed by the MVP of every Super Bowl through 2006. Um, yeah. that, that, that is our priceless item, if you will. Mm -hmm. And so we have auction items like that. And so it'll be a, uh, it'll be a fun event. Me and my co-chair, Dr. Hamdani, we're actually conducting the live auction. I think that's how Anthony sold some of his tickets, to watch that, that <laughs> unravel. Hmm. But uh, we're, really, we're really excited about it and the Motown theme, we have a great band, um, and uh, we're just gonna get people on their feet, and we're, we're, Mercy's gonna celebrate. We actually have two bands. Uh, there'll be That's one right. that'll play during the cocktail hour. Uh, we do have an open bar. We're drinking responsibly because you know addiction services are what this is all about. But uh, we uh, we have an open bar, and there'll be one band playing. Uh, we'll have the um, uh, award presentations, and then we'll have a wonderful dinner uh, with delicious food um, at the Mass Mutual Center, and uh, and then we'll start the dancing and have a great time. Okay, so if this is your one chance to sell people on going, why should they go to this event? Who does not want to meet Anthony Galloni? <laughs> <laughs> Where am I? <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's, it's this, as, as, as Mark alluded to for, for much of the program, this is really going someplace special. I think every person, certainly in my community, we can open our front door if we live in a populated area, and you can look at homes where opiate addiction or addiction in general has, has reared its, its ugly head. This touches everybody, and we are making a difference in addressing that. And by attending this gala, not only to, to join us in celebration, um, you're, you're making a difference to a cause that's affecting every family. I think that's why. What would you say to why people should well, attend? Well, I, I would echo that. I would uh, sum it up by saying it's a great event. It's going to be a fun event, but for a great, a great cause. And I'll put a, a pitch in for um, the live auction uh, that we're going to have as well. Um, we're actually going to be raffling off a, um, a long weekend in Detroit. And I can tell you from personal experience, uh, it's, a, uh, it's a great comeback city in America, uh, much like Springfield. And if you want to see what Springfield is going to look like in a few years and see the uh, tremendous um, uh, achievements they've made in Detroit and go to the Motown Museum, stand in the same place that Smokey Robinson uh, recorded uh, his songs and Diana Ross and the Supremes recorded their songs and have a great weekend of great food, um, entertainment, sports, um, Ford F-150 plant tour and, and many, many other great things. Um, come to the gala and uh, bid on that live auction item. Okay, we're looking at video right now from last year. How much fun did you guys have last year? A lot of fun. I, I think I remember it, but it was a, it was a <laughs> lot of fun. That's our last year's honorary chair we were just showing uh, in that slide, uh, John Schoberg and Brenda. Um, and uh, yeah, that, that was a lot of fun. We had some great auction items uh, last year as well. And it's a big, uh, it's a big part of the, uh, the event, um, uh, the, the, uh, the, the auction items and the, and the live auction. And that kicks off the spirit of how the evening's gonna go once that live auction takes hold and everybody knows that the dancing comes next. So it's, a, it's, it's not your typical big gala. Ours, ours is special and we're really proud of it. It brings together people from all different walks of life, all different professions, you know, people in government, people in the private sector, people in medical services, obviously. Uh, very well attended last year, and this year promises to be the same, if not more. Uh, I really had a lot of fun, and uh, this year is with the theme and with some of the auction items uh, and the people I know are going, it's, it's gonna be terrific to celebrate some of the accomplishments, celebrate uh, you know, what the honored guests, the award winners, so to speak, Governor Baker and Dan Keenan have done for this effort, uh, and also to acknowledge the seriousness of this problem at the same time, and do something toward that, do something to address it by just your very attendance, as well as maybe what you can you can give forward in the, the auctions and, and so forth. It's a night that moves quickly, but it's a lot of fun, and a lot of great people really concerned about this cause. 
Okay, we mentioned earlier in the program some of the guest speak speakers, but can you just go through those again so we know who we'll hear sure. from? Sure. So we're gonna we're not gonna do a lot of talking. There okay. won't be any uh, long lectures, um, but we will honor uh, Governor Baker. So an opportunity uh, to hear from from Governor Baker, uh, an opportunity to rub elbows uh, with uh, Governor Baker. So there's another plug that uh, a lot of folks don't always get the opportunity to do. Uh, Dan Keenan will be honored, so he'll have an opportunity to share some of his thoughts. Uh, in, um, in how he's helped advocate for uh, this important cause. Um, I'll make some remarks. Um, we'll have, obviously, remarks from our, uh, our very generous uh, chairs, um, Dr. Hamdani and, and uh, Paul, uh, who have given you know, self selflessly of their time uh, to help this important cause. And, and a few other surprises uh, wrapped in uh, folks that um, will uh, we'll address the group. But we'll keep the, the talking short and the dancing long. <laughs> All right. How much work has gone into putting this together? Well, this is a, this is ironically a fairly busy time at, at, <laughs> at my office, but uh, we started early this year because we knew we had to, um, and we uh, we really thanks to the support of the the uh, fundraising and foundation development people at Mercy who really helped with the logistics. Um, they 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 got me and uh, Dr. Hamdani to to a point where we were just out making our overtures to the to the public, um, and, uh, and and it's a good response because again it's 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 Mercy Hospital it's it's something special, and I think the gala will reflect that. Okay, for anyone who can't unfortunately attend the gala, how can they give still? Uh, our fund development department would be glad to accept. Uh, any donations, whether they're a cash donation or uh, somebody's interested in donating a good or service that we can uh, offer through the silent auction, um, it's a good way to showcase your business. So we'd be glad to uh, to accept those uh, donations as well. But contacting our fund development department again, um, all the information about how to contact our fund development department or to email them directly, um, you go to our website at mercycares.com. Okay, and it's not too late to get tickets. No. No, it's not. <laughs> when is the last possible day? <laughs> Tomorrow, uh, Monday. Okay, yeah. so there's still time. Yeah. All so right. This time, people must act. Chop, uh, chop. And we have all of the information on your screen right now. Again, we're talking about the Caritas Gala at the Mass Mutual Center. It's Saturday, April 21st at 6:30. So. Hope to see everyone there. Thank you. Just a final remark. I want to thank you, Ashley, um, for having the courage uh, to tackle this topic. I know it's not an easy one. I uh, also want to thank um, TV22 uh, for uh, hosting us to talk about this important event for most important cause. All right. We will have the last word after the break. Stay with us. You're watching 22 News in Focus. to News in Focus. Today we've been talking about the Caritas Gala on April 21st that will benefit Mercy Behavioral Healthcare's opioid epidemic treatment program. We've also discussed how the opioid crisis is impacting our area. That's our program for today. We want to thank our guests for joining us and thank you at home for watching. If you missed any of it, you can watch it in full on our website, WWLP.com. That's also where you can find more information on how to purchase tickets for the Caritas Gala. From all of us here at 22 News, we wish you a wonderful Sunday.